Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Oraculos True Divination Podcast, where I bring you ancient wisdom for the modern mystic. I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, and joining me today, all the way, not from, but in Norway, is Mr. Stephen Birchfield. Stephen, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Stephen, today you and I are going to dive into a fascinating discussion of traditional astrology, of which you are truly one of our leaders, and I can't wait to dive into that conversation with you. But before we get there, for those of you who this is your first time joining us here on the Oraculous True Divination Podcast, this is a podcast where I bring you interviews from astrologers from all around the world who are not just changing their own lives through their practice of astrology, but they're also changing the landscape of our astrology through their contribution, through their study, and through their efforts. So if you're interested in being a part of the magic and the momentum that we're building here on the Oraculous True Divination Podcast, please take a moment, go down below, hit on the like button, but also do subscribe to the True Divination Podcast so that you can be a part of not only this momentum, but also so that you can continue to receive notifications of when I bring these interviews to you. I try to do it once a week. And sometimes I even surprise you by bringing out interviews twice a week. So please do subscribe to the podcast so that you can be a part of it all here with us. Now, Stephen, you are quite the astrologer, but you also have quite the journey to astrology that's a little bit unorthodox because I know that you have, quote unquote, a regular nine to five history of your life. And then you also have the astrology that you've really spent a great part of your life studying. Can you tell us a little bit about your two sides, both Stephen, the non-astrologer, as well as Stephen, the astrologer? Yeah, I guess you could say there's actually three sides. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I mean, um, uh, I have degrees in uh, engineering, systems engineering and structural engineering. Um, so what I've probably the last 30 years, how long have I been in Norway? <laughs> I have to think now. I've been here uh, since 1988. So that's, uh, what is that? That's uh, 12, yeah, 32 years yeah. in Norway, around 30 years. Wow. Uh, I've worked as an engineer. Uh, I've had, well, I have, because I have a family. I had to support a family and, um, so that was kind of my profession but besides my profession leading up to it i've always had an interest in astrology i mean i can go back to the 60s when i went and saw hair in los angeles and you know and they saying you know uh, age of aquarius the age of aquarius right uh, when the moon is in the seventh house <laughs> right and I mean, I, I said, well, what, what is this? <laughs> what is this talking about? You know, I mean, there was that, uh, but I never really got into astrology at that time uh, because in 1972, I was born and raised in California, so that went to school there. Uh, but in 1972, I left. I, I wanted to do something else with my life other than you know. Uh, the everyday routine that I had gotten into there in California. Mm-hmm. Um, so I traveled to Europe and then uh, I was doing, uh, I did some missionary work in Africa, Middle East, East Europe, um, India. <laughs> I've traveled a lot in my years and I settled down. I met my wife in uh, 1988 uh, when I was working in East Europe and we met in Denmark. And so I moved to Norway. So there's that part of my life, (laughs) and then there's my life now as being a a professional. But there was a time when I went back to the States for a short time in the 70s because after being in Africa, I got very sick. Um, And I had to kind of get my health back. In order to do that, I returned to the States. It was at that time I got into astrology. That was around 1978, I imagine. And I started reading things like Howard Sesportus and, uh, you know, the psychological, archetypical uh, astrology. 
And then I left the States again and went back to do some more uh, missionary work. Uh, and uh, a few events changed my life as far as astrology was concerned. A uh, very primary event was, I was, uh, this was actually in 1991. Uh, uh, up to that point, I'd been studying modern astrology, uh, trying to practice it as well. Um, and uh, I was in uh, Eastern Europe. I was working in, in uh, Bosnia. And we had a, we about me and my wife's brother had been involved in building an orphanage there. And we were collecting food, clothing, and everything in Norway and Sweden and driving it down. And when I was uh, in the orphanage there, I met a young girl who was, uh, yeah, 14 years old. And I remember she got real, she was a very sweet girl, very sweet. She got very excited about, oh, you, you study astrology, <laughs> you know, can you do my chart? <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you get that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought, sure, you know, I, I looked at her chart and I mean, she had this very nice chart. I mean, planets and dignities, and very strong in angles and stuff. And then I started talking to her. And I found out that the, the girl had had tr real tragedy in her life uh, because of the conflict in that area. It was, the, there was horrendous things happening on both sides of the fence. And her family, her she had nine brothers and three sisters and her mom. And uh, her, her brothers and her dad were shot in front of her. And uh, then she and her sisters and her mother were systematically raped and uh, so you can imagine, I mean, that, that's, that's tragedy on a level that uh, very few people really have lived that kind of tragedy. Yeah. And so when I was looking at her chart, I, I, I threw my hands up in there and I said, I'm sorry, I, I can't do that. I don't see it in your chart. I can't. How do you explain this? Do you, I mean, are you somebody that has issues with your dad? <laughs> I mean, is that why he got rid of him? I, it was at that level. So I really got frustrated with astrology at that time. And uh, I remember I came back home and I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. It just doesn't make sense. Modern astrology just didn't make sense. It's, you know, talking about the evolution of the mind and this and that and the other persons. I mean, it just, no. It didn't add up for this poor girl. And about the same time, I, got, I had a friend who was uh, in the States, and uh, we were having several discussions, <laughs> and he was a student of Robert Zoller way back in the day. Uh, and uh, he got me, he kind of got my interest, and I found out that they were starting a, you know, Project Hindsight was just starting up. So I got in touch, and I became, you know, a subscriber there, and you know, got all the books and started reading and that changed my life. I mean, what I was reading, it was like, it was no longer, well, a world of, uh, you know, potential, but it was actual reality, objective things coming to life for me. Uh, but it was very hard. Uh, there, there was, there's very little written on how to organize all that so that you could use it in a practical way. How do you delineate a chart using this material? And of course, the majority of it was uh, uh, Greek Hellenistic astrology, which I really love. Valens and Dorotheus and Antiochus, and uh, I've read them all and studied them all very well. Uh, and there's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, but then I was, couldn't quite put it all together. So in 2000, and I, I was looking yesterday because I was talking to somebody. They asked me, when did you study with Robert Zoller? And I, I said, well, 2005. But then I started looking at my emails, and it was actually 2003. <laughs> so it was actually 2003. I, I wrote, I got in touch with Robert, and I asked him, you know, uh, I would like to study under you. And I got, no. <laughs> uh, I said, I, I, I'm full. Yeah, he says, I, got, I can't handle any more students. So I was a little disappointed, but I said, okay. But a few weeks later, uh, I got another letter from Robert, and he, uh, he said, well, you know, one of these, uh, one of these uh, people who have dropped out, so I have an empty spot if, you're, uh, if you really want it. I said, that's, 
great. So I, I started studying under Robert at that time. And of course, that was at a time when Robert was uh, breaking away from New Library and he broke out on his own and uh, rewrote his whole course. Uh, anyway, I studied, I took my exam with uh, Robert in, when was it? January of 2005, I think. So a little over a year I studied with him. And it was difficult studying with him because, as you know, he suffered from Parkinson's. So uh, him answering mail and uh, answering questions, and it was a slow process at times. And I understood that. I mean, it was very easy to understand. Um, but anyway, I graduated with I got my diploma from him. Um, he didn't give diplomas. He just said, okay, you passed your exam. <laughs> so, so now you have, you have the right to have this a title, uh, uh, Adept as a Medievalist Astrologist, you know, uh, which is AMA that he gave to people that passed his diploma course. And after that time, I mean, I was in contact with Robert, but I started practicing at that time. There's two things I did. I was continuing to read and study. And I was working a full-time job as, as an engineer and uh, doing charts. That's, that's all I did for, gosh, <laughs> many years until I retired. Two years ago, I retired. Wow. And that opened up a little bit more for me to, you know, my kids are all grown, so I don't have them to worry about anymore. <laughs> and it's like, uh, I can spend time doing the things that I love the most. Mm -hmm. And uh, astrology is one of them. And uh, so I'm still, I has, still do clients charts. I have clients that I've had for, oh, since 2000 and, this is 2005, I think. So that's what, 15 years I've had some of these mm -hmm. clients. They come back year after year and I do new re returns for them. And, and they bring family members in and say, could you do the air chart also? And uh, yeah. it's more word of mouth than anything else. And, uh, uh, so that's basically how I kind of got into astrology and uh, my, a little bit of my history I'm mm -hmm. in astrology. I always find it interesting how so many of our elders in astrology who I've been interviewing have had to live a life where they had to balance a full-time job, a nine-to-five job, a full family, and oh, I, yes. <laughs> and I know that you have a full family, yes. and everything else, but yet you are still able to make time and space for your astrology and to become adept within your astrology, even given the other very important variables of your life. And I think that that's completely commendable because a lot of who you are today i'm sure was built during those formative years when you did still have a job when you did still have to worry about your family when you did still have to do all of the mundane affairs of the world as well as study your astrology yes it was a big responsibility i have 12 children which is people <laughs> <I> know <laughs> I, I i i wasn't going to say it but <laughs> that's okay i don't mind uh, i i love my kids you know, I have 12 children, 19 grandchildren, wow. three great-grandchildren. So I, that's a big part of my life right yeah. there. And uh, I've had lots of charts to work with and <laughs> real-life examples of watching people grow up and see things happen in lives. And, yeah. and maybe that's actually a big help, been a big help for me. Mm -hmm. uh, having family and relatives and uh, people around me, and it's nice that uh, I've been, I knock on wood that, all my kids are doing well and alive and you know mm -hmm. had tragedy in life too yeah. one of my sons had cancer so it's like we go through things in life right and we've yeah. had all those challenges in life yeah all right so Stephen, i am burning to know at this point were any of your kids twins no <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> but two wives yeah okay <laughs> just so that's clear <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my, I was married uh, earlier. My first wife is French. Yeah. And we had five children together. And I mean, we're still friends. We I still, still visit France all the time and visit my kids. Two of my kids live in the States. They moved to the States. Mm -hmm. So they're in California. And uh, then I have seven children here in Norway. Mm -hmm. so, 
my wife had two children from before, and then we had five together. So good stuff. <laughs> that makes a lot of kids. <laughs> uh, we were very disappointed this year because actually in March we were supposed to have a, our first real family reunion. Wow! I had my kids coming from the states. All my kids in France. Yeah, kids from Norway were going to go down. And then this virus thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and so everybody got a lockdown. <laughs> it was a big disappointment, actually, because we were planning on it. It was, it was going to be the big thing, you know? Mm -hmm. so, well, hopefully you guys can, can push it down later on in the year or, or somewhere so that you can still make that happen. Yeah, well, you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, I visit my kids all the time anyway. I travel yeah. and visit them, so... I've seen all my kids. It's not that the problem, but it would have been nice to have them. Everyone together. We needed a very big place. <laughs> 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 I mean, because all but, let's see, one, all but uh, three of them are married, you know, and all have families. So you're talking about, you know, having husbands and wives come and children, grandkids, and it would have been a real. <laughs> yeah, it's <was> a big, <laughs> it's a big. Um, yeah. Who knows? Maybe another time. Precisely. Okay. Now, Stephen, talk to me about some of the work that you've done post your relationship with Robert Zoller, because I know that you have continued to study. You've continued to be a scholar of traditional astrology. So, can you tell us a bit about what you've done since your studies with Robert Zoller? Yeah, well, um, first of all, the translation work has been a big motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, you have been it's, uh, translating like crazy. He's published how many books now and uh, translations. Yeah. And uh, we also now, I mean, just recently, uh, uh, Levante uh, Laszlo, I think. Yes, 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 yes. Levante. Uh, Roy, he has this project going on where he's translating all the untranslated Greek texts. And he contacted me and asked me to be as an advisor and to read through the texts and, you know, comment and, you know, just kind of not tell them what it is, but just kind of have an opinion about things. and. Mm -hmm. We see a little bit about the story. So that's actually something very current that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And previously I worked with Ben. Uh, he, his last two translations of uh, on Abu Mashar and Saul, I worked with him on. I didn't do any translation, but I read them for him and I made comments. And sometimes you see those comments in, in his book. <laughs> uh, but I've, I've really been, I wanted an astrology that was practical. I'm an engineer. We're kind of realists. You know, <laughs> things, you know. yeah. things have to work. Yeah. Um, if I went to my job and somebody asked me, well, I'm going to design a brand new house, but we need to know that uh, all this, its structural integrity is correct. So I have to go through the whole house. And I have to you know, project the house and make sure that everything... And uh, they, they gave me a picture. I had one client like that. and uh, They gave me a house and the whole front of the house was nothing but windows on the end of the house. And it was like a square long type house, uh, Funkus house, you know. And uh, it wouldn't have worked. The first big wind that came along, but it collapsed on that end of the house. So I had to, you know, but that was my job. Okay, that's my job is to use uh, physics and conceptual language that we have in uh, using mathematics to answer questions about the structure of this building. And amazingly, I think astrology has very much the same way. Uh, for me, it is. Uh, when, I, when I practice astrology, I see it as a, a, as a conceptual system. I, I never see the planets as actually doing things or, you know, my, I'm a scientist too, and I'm sorry, there's no evidence of that other than the sun and the moon. There's no evidence of that. Uh, but that doesn't mean I reject it because uh, I think there's a, as a conceptual language, it's amazing, especially in traditional and medieval astrology. Uh, when I say traditional, I mean, a lot of people think of Renaissance astrology, uh, which is why I kind of say classical and medieval. Classical is the Hellenistic, medieval is the Persians, and 
and they took, they were very, the Persians were organizers above all. If you look at everything they did with science, they didn't really innovate anything special, but they were very good at collecting things and organizing it in the tables of, uh, for example, uh, spherical geometry and trigonometry and things like this. They put into tables, which came from India, they came from Babylon, they you had all these places that had different things, but nobody had put it into a real working system. And that's, that's the real gift of what the Arabs did and the Persians, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was the same I see with astrology, you know, you had Hellenistic astrology, you had Vedic astrology, these things were current at the time. And they took these concepts and ideas and put them into a system, a, a holistic system as well. It wasn't just any system, and, and, and it works incredibly good. It, it, it's very good at description, describing people's lives. It's very common, it can be complicated, because as you know, if you, you're studying it, so you know that you know Venus can symbolize many things. It can have a signification for many things. Mm -hmm. And how do you determine those things in a chart? You know, which is why they had so many techniques, because the more testimony that you had of something, it's like a courtroom, right? You go into a courtroom and you say, this guy did this and we have this evidence, right? Yeah. One testimony isn't usually enough. Usually you have to present, you know, a, a, a plethora of evidence in order to uh, convict somebody. Of it. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's what, that's what these guys had, that's what they believed. The, especially the Persians, I know they believed it because if you read like, especially Saul, I was really, really impressed with that book. Mm -hmm. um, every book that's been translated so far, that book has blown my mind in so many ways because Saul was very good about collecting Dorotheus, al and Zagar, uh, Vaisis Valens, Marshal Allah, uh, Ali uh, Abu Ali. I mean, he Al Kindi. Theophilus, he, he quotes these people in his book. Mm -hmm. So he put together a system that, I mean, he didn't really put it together because it was a system already there, but it's just organized in a clean and orderly way so that it's easy to access and to learn from. So uh, basically that's what I've been doing since uh, finishing my studies with uh, Robert Zoller. Of course, there several years I've always been in contact with him. We've had correspondence and we've discussed different things in his old teachings that, you know, that I know he was starting to kind of change <laughs> in several things. And so uh, we all do that. You know, we all go through um, kind of a growing stage. I mean, I did the same thing. I was involved with a lot of uh, astrology groups one time, at one point in time. And then it was just too much. I had to quit everything and, you know, time with my family, time at work, time with my studies, time with my clients, really focus for several years. So it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and especially today, there's so much material. Where do you start? You know, what is, I kind of grew up in it when they were translating with uh, Project uh, Hindsight. I started with the first texts, you know, um, and I have them all, and I still study them, I still read them. I, uh, so that's kind of where I went. I just let, Robert Zoller gave me a, a system, a very basic system. Now his system was very much based on Benati and on Morinus. Those were the two people he really quotes a lot. Of course, uh, I think it was his name, uh, Zoltan Mason, was his teacher. And, yeah. Uh, so some techniques were handed to him, uh, which we're going to talk about a little bit. Mm -hmm. But from that time, it's like, even at that time, I remember writing uh, Robert, because I had early, as early as 1990, when, when was it translated? 1993, I think, that uh, Robert Schmidt translated the Greek version of uh, On Revolutions of the Years of Nativities. Well, not the whole thing, but part of it he, he translated. He never got to the first to the second chapters, but everything else, he everything that was translatable, he translated. So I had it from a very early time, and I knew in that, it talks about the Ferraria, for example, the, the Fadarat, right. and uh, gives the proper order for them, 
uh, which is not only there, but it's in the al and It came from the Persian side. So I had things that it was easy for me to discuss with Robert, you know, and say, well, I've read this, you know, what do you think? And, you know, uh, so from that point on, I grew. He got me started. He got me pointed in the direction I needed to go, gave me the tools to work with, which was really important, you know. And uh, so from there, it's just been a growing under my own steam. So to speak. Well, other people. I work with a lot of other people as well. So right. I have that input as well. Right. Stephen, I heard you mention a while ago that Robert Zoller, after you had studied with him, he had begun to shift some things that he was teaching previously. Uh, do you remember well, yeah, what any I mean, of those things were? Well, yeah. I mean, very specifically, I mean, one of the teachings that he was beginning, that he wrote me, that he said, well, I'm starting to consider other options here. It was the order of the Fedara, because uh, he was using, he had understood the Fedaria from Bonati. Bonati is just repeating al -Kabisi. It's almost verbatim from Al Kabisi, actually. Um, Al Kabisi was not real clear in it, the instructions as well. So it's very easy to understand how somebody could think, well, you know, that uh, the nodes should fall at the same place in both charts because it kind of sounded that way when it was explained. However, uh, as I said, as early as 1990, I forget. I, I can't remember exactly the publishing date. I think it was 93, when it might have been even earlier than that. One of the first things he translated was uh, On Solar Revolutions by Abu Mushar. And in there, at the end of the, it gives the, co the correct version. And I remember talking with uh, Robert about it. We had some correspondence with mail. And he said, yeah, he was, I understand that. And he said, I'm really, uh, he talked about uh, how Robert Hand was, you know, like me, myself, I believe that the correct order was that uh, they were not the same in both uh, both sects of the of the order of the Fadaria were not the same. Uh, it was it was an order in that they followed the Chaldean order. Put it like this: the sun on it starts with the sun on one side, starts with the moon. But in uh, Abu Mishar's book, it's very clear that the nodes come at the end in both cases at the end of each of all the planets after they have given their testimony then it was the two nodes mm -hmm. uh, and we talked and he said the main reason that he was he was following was what he thought from Bonatti was because that uh, in nocturnal charts and he, he had a chart specifically that he was thinking of and that was Christopher Reeves and the accident that he had, he had a nocturnal chart. He said, well, it was in his 40th years when, you know, went into the south node. And he said, uh, south node was in his ascendant and this thing. And we started talking and said, yeah, at the same time, though, uh, that's not the only indicator of, I mean, if you look at the ages of man, and this is what he told, he told me, he said, I realize now that there's a lot of things that could signify at that age. And it's not just necessarily nocturnal, but it could be diurnal as well. But he was saying that we have the ages of man. That's, that's when Mars takes over the ages. Mars is the age of conflicts and things that we have. The sun is our time when we're pushing into the world and we're, you know, getting reputation. And we're fighting to start our, our uh, recognition, put it like this. And then uh, when it gets to, my, right after that, it's Mars period. And that's when we meet conflicts and things that go wrong and uh, Martian things, you know, which is accidents like uh, Christopher Lee's had. So like he told me, he said, so I'm having to reevaluate a lot of the things that I, I taught. And so Rob, this is, these are things like that, that Robert was going to change. Uh, I don't think he got a chance to do so much. Because, you know, as I said, he was, his Parkinson's was go going from bad to worse the whole time. He was having to move a million places from British Columbia to South Africa, back to the States. And, and uh, his life was uh, pretty tumultuous during that time. So how much he really got to get into changing his course or anything like that, I doubt 
seriously so much got was done but I, I like you said I'm blessed to have a lot of correspondence with uh, where we talk together in mail and I've got those so it's like it's a historical record as well uh, which is nice but yeah Robert wasn't cast in stone as well I mean he had his he had his pet ideas uh, but that's typical of anybody you know? and, and Robert was a he was a good teacher. He, he really expected people to, uh, what should I say, to achieve. He, he didn't set the bar low for people. You know, I mean, he, you either did the work and you understood it. And if you didn't understood it, then try to get the answers and, you know, make it. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know in actuality how many people, you know, finished his course or anything. I, I don't have, I know Ben Dykes, Honor Dosa. Uh, Clelia Romano in uh, South America. These are people that I know, that I've worked with, that I've uh, had, you know, mainly because we come from the same lineage, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now, specific to the topic that we're going into today, which is essentially traditional approaches to character delineation, how do you find traditional astrology is different than modern astrology? How is it different? Well, there's a lot of differences. <laughs> uh, when you just think about the conception of the, the zodiac in, in itself, yeah, it's totally night and different. I mean, uh, in modern astrology, we, it was looked at like, uh, okay, the first house is you know our personification, and second house is how we think about money, and third house is what do we think about our you know, relatives, it's like an evolution of, of the person, the whole chart. Yeah. Traditional astrology is not like that at all. <laughs> There's only one place that talks about the native, and that's the ascendant. And uh, so when that's really a very big difference. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as we were talking about earlier, that uh, that's where all these techniques grew out of, were questions about a native's life and, and that is the ascendant there's no other place mm -hmm. you can break down things in the person's life like the person's actions what they do you know that's very much seen in part of fortune part of spirit midheaven um, that's a whole other thing and then you see uh, but what they are and about their character the qualities of their soul <laughs> Is it psychological? I guess to a certain extent it is. I don't know if I'd really call it psychology though. Yeah. Uh, because psychology speaks about potentials and you know, this person could be this way. But I mean, traditional law, uh, language speaks more, this is the, this is the person, mm -hmm. you know, this is his character. Uh, it's it's much more objective rather than subjective, um, so those are very different things about tradition, uh, classical astrology and modern astrology. Okay, and as it relates to this topic of character delineation, what are some of the things that you're going to be sharing with us today from a traditional perspective? Yeah, I was kind of the last week. I was taking some time to kind of look through my notes and. I happen to be writing, I'm, I'm doing a course, I'm writing a course, which I told you. I'm, I just started, uh, I did the first lesson of the second part of the course on delineation. The very next lesson is all about this. <laughs> so it's something I'm working on actually, so I was reviewing my notes. Uh, and how much can I go into it today? I think it's, it, I can only brush the very surface of these things because okay. it, they're topics that they really require a lot of study. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and some of the topics have different backgrounds but can be understood in different ways. I think about the Almaton figures, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, saying that, I mean, it has a classical connotation for all the way back to Socrates and Plato. What is the daemon, you know, uh, Iamblichus, uh, Porphyry, they, 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 they had all these discussions about it. But that is a very, what you should say, a philosophical approach rather than, and like I said, I am a Christian, so my approach is going to be 
geared more to what is in the word of God rather than you know, mm-hmm. what some philosopher. Although, by all means, Paul, the Apostle Paul, was well-versed in Plato. I can, I can go through the, his writings in the Bible, in the New Testament. I can pull out whole quotes straight out of Plato. <laughs> the Republic especially, he was very fond of uh, quoting that one. So it's like we do have that philosophy in Christianity, but, mm-hmm. but not in quite the same way. So some things uh, I have, the, especially doctrines like the Albertan figures, which was translated loosely as a guardian angel, or Zoller uh, translated it more like that. Well, it's what they meant to. But what the Bible says is a guardian angel is something totally different. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. uh, again, so yeah, uh, these are things that are have philosophical basis. But there are other things which are really good to to delineate. And in my studies, I just recently came across a quote uh, because uh, one of the first things that you're going to start delineating is the ascendant. Right? You're going to look at the the ascendant. You know, look at the Lord of the Ascendant. You want to look at where the Lord of the Ascendant is in the chart, what house it's in. And uh, we learned a technique from Robert Zoller. It was called the uh, prime motivation. Right? It's a technique that was actually taught to him by Zoltan Mason. And so, and and he says in his class, he said, "This is a little bit of psycho- psychology." But mm-hmm. the funny part about it is, I just recently came across a quote in Saul which was, just knocked me over when I read it. Uh, it was an amazing quote, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. see if I can get it up here. It says, he says, now, Saul is talking, and he says, now, if you saw the Lord of the Ascendant in a position, in a cart, then he, the, the native, mm-hmm. is in need of the essence of that sign and place. So see what it grants. Wow. I mean, that, that quote right there was the teaching that Zoller got from Jotan Mason. I doubt if he saw it because we've never <laughs> had this text from, from, from Saul until now. Yeah. Uh, it's the, 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 his book of Nativity is on nativities has never been translated uh, until now. So I was, I was floored because here we are practicing something that was actually... <laughs> Advocated by here by a Persian astrologer, so uh, yeah, where to begin with all this stuff? It's 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 a lot of things to discuss. Mm-hmm. Talking about the character, and I talk about uh, very much about how uh, astrology is holistic in nature, because you can't just take the Senate, you can't just take the Midheaven, you can't just take you know the issues of health, but they all work together. A person's temperament is going to have something to say about his health. A person's how he deals with sickness and illness is going to be how his, you know, qualities of his mind. Uh, what he does in life is not only the 10th house, but it's also very much determined as we read in Vicious Valens. Actions are determined both by a lot of fortune and spirit. You know, they have very much about what actions a person is going to do. Two very different types of actions. Mm -hmm. So you're getting into a very holistic type of reading where you you gather information and it's like putting together this figure of of a person. And then you have this figure of the person. And so it's much easier when you're looking at other things because the other things are just accidents happening to that person. What a person does, a person marries, a person has children. Uh, if they're going to have lands or their inheritance, you know, their their heritage or their, their parents and things like this, these are all accidents that happen to the native. So uh, the very first step in delineating any chart is starting with the ascendant. If you don't know, uh, Saul even says this in, in, when he's talking about uh, studying, you know, professions. And he says, well, the very first thing you have to study very thing, first thing you have to know, does this have, person have a chronic illness? Because it's going to have a big effect on what they do. Mm-hmm. So this is what I mean when I say holistic. It's like everything works together in a chart rather than just one individual part. You know, you can look at it. But everything, uh, I had 12 children, but if you didn't understand that I had two wives, right, all of a sudden you understand, well, okay, it's very possible for him to have that many children. 
He's got two wives. Maybe this other wife brought children into the family. Yes, yeah. that, that, that happened. So this happens all the time. So like I said, it's not just evaluating one thing. Okay, we're going to talk about When I do a chart for somebody, I don't just look at the fifth house and say, oh, well, yeah, you, you might have children, you know. But I have to look at everything. I have to look at, well, are they sterile? Do they have any illness? Is there anything in the chart that might indicate they can't have children? Right? Yep. Is there anything in the chart that indicates that maybe he's going to have several wives, <laughs> you know? and end up with many children? <laughs> I, I don't know. So these, this is how delineation works. Uh, and it's things that we're learning more and more about. The more charts that you, the person does, then the more you realize that, well, I can't just talk about that. I have people write me. They say, I want to know what kind of profession am I going to do? I say, man, I have to do all of this first. Yeah. Okay? I have to do this first. I have to understand you. I have to understand how you think, your temperament, the gifts that you're given. What kind of education do you have? You know, what, is, what does the chart say about education? You know, what does it say about religion? What does it say about your, your, your beliefs? You know, all these things work together in chart. Many of those things come from the first house. Yes. I remember in terms of this, in terms of this piece that you're saying about Zoltan Mason, and let me just grab his book so people can see it. This is the book that you're referring to by Zoltan Mason. It is called uh, Astrosynthesis for yes. our viewers. And it essentially outlines book 21 of the work of Jean-Baptiste Morin de Villefranche. And it's a book about chart delineation. And I remember that uh, Robert Corey, who is a major proponent of Zoltan Mason, who also studied with him, says that when people asked Zoltan uh, in an hour-long reading how long, or rather, when people ask Zoltan Mason in an hour-long reading, how much time do you spend on the first house, on the Ascendant, Zoltan said the entire hour. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's very true that we must continuously bring everything back to the person who is essentially the native of the chart. And oftentimes our astrology takes us in these wild spiraling paths away from that ascendant. But we as astrologers have to skillfully find a way to come back to the ascendant because we always have to keep in focus who it is we're speaking to. And yes. another thing in terms of modern astrology specifically is that there's this emphasis in modern astrology on where the sun is or on the sun placement. And I was speaking with another astrologer who I really respect who said that sun sign astrology is really what helps astrology to stay alive in the 20th century while it That's was... That's probably very true. That's yeah. probably very true. Yeah. And... I would probably agree with that. <laughs> I mean, uh, what was her name? Linda... Linda Goodman. <laughs> Right? I mean, she wrote two books, on, one on relationships, one on sun signs. Yeah. Those books sold millions of copies. <laughs> I mean, it really brought, it, it kept the astrology alive. Uh, it did, in yeah. one way. One. And I think that, I think that it's, it's, you know, a lot of people use that version of astrology as their gateway into the actual astrology that we practice. I yeah. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was my gateway. Yeah. But when we get into it, we find that there is this far more nuanced way of looking at a person. And that's where your teaching about the ascendant comes into place, is it? Yeah, that's very true. Like I said, I'm, I am a, 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 I studied for almost six years mm -hmm. to get my master's degree in, in uh, mathematics and in uh, physics and in chemistry and all these things that led me into systems engineering and uh, structural engineering. It wasn't something that was easy. And there's kind of this, um, in Norway, we have an expression when somebody's a little naive, we say they're very blue eyed. I mean, it's every Norwegian has blue eyes. <laughs> I don't know why they say that, but they say a person is a little blue eyed. <laughs> and people are a little naive to think that astrology is something so simple. Yeah. As a sun sign. Yeah. When we are so complex of an individual, I mean, I mean any psychologist will tell you that we're complex. Mm -hmm. and I'm not a psychologist, and I don't practice psychology, 
uh, I do practice uh, natal delineation, in which case I do have to work with the person's character. And, uh, like I said, the very first place, and the very kind of an over ordinate, well, well, no, that's, that's Norwegian. I'm sorry, sometimes I, I fall into saying something in Norwegian because this, it's very unusual for me to speak English like this. <laughs> It's not something I do every day. Uh, <laughs> so I ask people to bear with me that I say something weird and they say, what did that mean? You know, it's like, what is it talking about? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a joy and a beauty to hear your Norwegian slip in. So please do, don't yes. apologize. We say that something is prior, prior, right? Yeah. You have a priority to things. And uh, that's the way it is when we're working with a the chart. There's things that you have to look at first before you can go to something else. And uh, it's the same thing in, in my my day-to-day -day profession. This is something I was very used to. And so in, in a way, I was kind of looking for the same thing in, in astrology. I, I, I was very unhappy and uh, modern, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry people out there, I, but I, I thought modern astrology was uh, bunk. <laughs> it was, I, I guess that's the best way for me to put it. I, I know I'll make a lot of enemies this way before I get into it. No, <laughs> no, I think I think that it's I think that it's really about different strokes for different folks. And on the podcast I've interviewed very traditional astrologers and I've interviewed very modern astrologers. And I think that people gravitate to what gravitates to them. And this is a space of just us speaking our truth and standing in our truth and knowing that at the end of the day, we can all still be friends. Yeah, well, when it came down to the, 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 bo the bottom line is that I related to it because of my, what I do in life. Yeah. I, mean, I could relate to traditional astrology much better than I could to modern astrology. Perhaps yeah. that's the best way for me to say it. Good. Uh, not that it like this resonance or anything, like, but it's the way I studied my my profession. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm going to build a house, then I start from the ground up, and I, you know, mm -hmm. when I did my course, I'm doing this course. I use references to my architecture, housing, and engineering, houses and things like this, and, you know, because it's something everybody can relate to. Very yeah. simple everyday things that they can relate to. If I'm going to build a house, I, I don't pour the concrete floor and put up the walls without considering, well, where, we, where do we need water? And where do we need to, to evacuate a toilet? And where do we need, you know, all these things need to be put in first because mm -hmm. afterwards it's a little late. Well, yeah. it's not too late, but it would be, you know, going in the middle of the floor, you want to pipe, you know. It's, uh, yeah. So there's a, there's a method to the madness, so to speak. Yeah. Once you really understand the method, uh, I remember Robert, he said something. He said, this, our, our, our medieval astrology, it's something anybody can learn. He said, because there's order to it, there's rhyme to it, there's reason. Uh, this, these are things that he, and of course that spoke to me very mm -hmm. loudly. Uh, it's something I could relate to. Yeah. So that's the way I practice my astrology. So i very organized and very, I mean, uh, I do what they could. <laughs> I was at a lecture a year ago. I did a lecture in uh, Istanbul, and uh, I worked with Esan at that time. He was an uh, Iranian, mm -hmm. a Vedic astrologer, actually, but he's really a, a fan of Persian astrology, of course. Mm -hmm. And I remember I showed him how I made a, what they call a similicum. Mm -hmm. Similicum. And it's just nothing but a spreadsheet where I have the planets, I have, you know, all the information about it. You have to see it to understand it. Yeah. Uh, and he looked at it and he said, my God, the Persians did this. The exact same thing. And he showed me this table that he pulled out from a, a, a chart that somebody did and it looked the exact same thing that I had done. Wow. It was amazing. So, yeah, I, I guess I have the same kind of spirit helpers as we want to put it to, that goes to that type of information and uh, yeah so it's a, and when we talk about the ascendant yes it's very structured can you talk to us about some of the initial steps that you take or can you can you show us or demonstrate for us some of the initial steps that you take yeah um i have in front of me here i just had i made took some i made some notes 
I get, and, and actually Robert Zoller started, this was the first technique that he taught us in delineation, was looking at the ascendant. You look at the, call, at the nature of the ascendant, of the sign, right? See what kind of sign it is. Is it masculine? Is it uh, fixed? Is it mutable? Is it uh, cardinal is actually a better word. Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, understand changeable. They don't, when I say changeable, they say what? <laughs> Mutable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, or card cardinal signs. Right. Cardinal, uh, movable, changeable. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's the modern terminology there. Yeah. Uh, I happen to fall into the old language here. I, not quite as bad as uh, Robert Schmidt. <laughs> I, I don't use all the old names, Celine and uh, you know, Helios. And, uh, yeah. I, I didn't get that far into it. <laughs> For me, oh, it's a sun, it's the moon. <laughs> yeah. But I understand, actually, I understand very much why Robert Schmidt did that. Mm -hmm. Because in the Greek, I mean, Greek words conveyed ideas. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to translate that into one word. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, even in the middle, middle evil astrology, it's very hard to just translate simple things into great. But anyway, yeah. uh, prime motivation was probably the very first step in delineating a person's chart, uh, the person in the chart. Mm -hmm. uh, Zoller, he called it, of course, prime motivation. Mashallah called it inclinations of the natives. Mm -hmm. He looked at the ascendant as well, and the ascendant ruler. Mm -hmm. He didn't quite look at it the same way. Mashallah would look at whether it was oriental or where it was in the chart, its face to the sun, much the same way that uh, Ptolemy would look at Mercury and the moon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but it's there. Uh, looking at the ascendant ruler, uh, and as I wrote now in Saul, I came across this quote where Saul specifically says that when you find the Lord of the ascendant someplace in the chart, you look at the sign and you say that 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 the symbolism of that is that that person is going to need the essence of that sign in that place. Wow! And the sign in the house. It needs the essence of it. I mean, that's what prime motivation is, isn't it? Right? Exactly. That, that's where we're going. That's where our desires are going for. So uh, if I can, I, I can just use my chart. Uh, I, I will discuss it because it's the easiest for me to discuss off the yeah. top of my head. Well, I can discuss others, but I, I think I would have to have the permission. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a, a Taurus on the ascendant. Mm -hmm. So Venus is the ruler. Well, where is the ruler? You know, my chart. I have to look for the ruler. Ruler is in Scorpio, in the seventh sign. So where has much of my life been directed in relationships? I mean, I've been married twice. I didn't get married a lot of times, but both times, first time was 14 years, second time was 28 years. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I jumped from relationship, but I'm, that's where I was seeking yes. find fulfillment in my life. Yes. Okay. And so one of the first things that we talk about, well, will that happen? You know, will you find fulfillment? You know, how do you know? Well, this, what's the state of Venus in, 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 in Scorpio? Well, it happens, to be, have, have, happens to be the sign opposite or domicile. So uh, we call it today detriment. They didn't really have a name for it back in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not like a planet in its fall, that, that they all talk about, but detriment was not so much discussed. It was, it was off in the sense that where the ascendant, we know that a planet in its own sign creates, starts things, has this ability to make things come to life. Well, when it's in the sign opposite, it's everything opposite of that. Everything dies out there, Every, right? Everything comes to an end. Mm. And I got my, I, two divorces. So, yeah, even though I was married a long time, and the ruler of the house, Mars, happens to be in his exaltation. So it's like, it wasn't that marriage was bad like that. But all things come to an end. And that was my destiny with that. And mm -hmm. it really was. And I didn't plan it that way. I didn't say, well... My chart says that, so it must happen. Yeah. It came, that realization came around a little bit slow. You know, thought, wow, yeah, I do always try to find relationships and, you know, uh, fulfill my life and other people and other things, you know. 
And that's just been a part of my life. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I was a missionary. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you can look at all these things and you see it in my life. But that's kind of the first thing. And then, of course, I have uh, Taurus on the ascendant. So it's a feminine sign. It's fixed. What does that mean? It means that I'm more reactive than active. It means that uh, uh, I'm very solid, I'm very dependable, I'm, you know, uh, fixed ideas. And I, mean, I can go through a whole list of things that it says. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, but that's just one side of it. Another side that actually Robert never talked about, but it's something that I brought in from Hellenistic astrology because it's something that's actually very real is that uh, the ascendant is representing the native incarnate, if you will, defines his most basic drives and his basic needs, right? But what about being in harmony with the chart? Uh, what I mean about that is that there's something very prior in our, when we do charts, and that is the fact that the sun is either above the horizon or below the horizon. If it's above the horizon, the chart is diurnal. If it's below the horizon, the chart is nocturnal. And a lot has been said. I've read, you know, Robert's book, Robert Hand's book on sect. And some things are a little bit unfortunate, I think, the way they're presented. Mm -hmm. uh, because to say that a planet is in sect or out of sect is perhaps not the correct way to say things. But rather, a planet belongs to a sect or is contrary to a sect is actually a better terminology because the day and night is two different agendas. Right. This is what I'm getting at. Okay. Uh, you have a diurnal agenda and the planets that are diurnal planets all are members. If you would like, look at it as, as, as a political parties, you have two political parties, right? Mm -hmm. And when you have a diurnal chart, it's the diurnal agenda. That's the party in power. They have authority, so they're going to do their things. The nocturnal planets are, they don't have the majority. So what do they have to do a lot? They have to compromise. They have to give up some of their own agenda in order to do things. And this is actually a real essence of a sect determination. So when I'm talking about the ascendant, I look at the ascendant and say, well, is it, a, is it the sect of the chart? In my case, I have a nocturnal chart. I have a nocturnal ascendant. My ascendant is a nocturnal uh, sign, feminine sign. The ruler of my chart is in a feminine sign. So there's a great deal of harmony in my nature. Mm. Okay? We can call that a basic harmony that's there. Uh, I have another client, and this person has Sagittarius. It has a nocturnal chart. Sagittarius on the ascendant and uh, the Jupiter, the Lord, and, and Libra. And this person, it's really interesting because I was talking to this person about it and I said, well, all it means is that you have to accommodate more. You as a person are going to be an accommodating person. And this person really is. Uh, this person is, is, is somebody who's... Uh, has very strong opinions because her ascendant is a fire sign. It is yeah. all about freedom to express, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is the way this native is. But on the other hand, this native is really accommodating to other thoughts mm -hmm. because they have to be in order to get on in the world. In order to achieve their motivation, they have to accommodate. So it's like this is also something that you have to look at when you're looking at the ascendant. First, you know, you have to look at the ruler, you have to look at the sign, you have to look at where the ruler is. Then you look, is there a harmony in the chart? Is there a harmony between the ascendant and the chart and the, and the sect of the chart? Can the, can the ruler, because that's going to make a difference whether the ruler is successful or not. Part of the, it, it, are they, if it's a diurnal planet in a nocturnal chart, it's not going to be as successful as a nocturnal planet in a nocturnal chart. So this is another part of it. This is something that I kind of added mm -hmm. into the whole doctrine because it's something that I came across that where in, in a couple authors I read, well, does the ascendant agree? You know, oh, wow, well, is that something I need to think about? You know, and I started thinking about, it. yeah. Right. 
that's really interesting because I had never heard that before. And also, when you started to describe that chart, I thought that you were talking about my chart because, because, <laughs> <laughs> because I have been well. I mean, I mean, pretty close. Yeah, as you were talking about it, I was thinking about how that fit within my life in this context of there being harmony within my chart and having a nocturnal chart with a diurnal sign on the cusp of the ascendant and my chart ruler as a diurnal planet but in a nocturnal sign i'm i'm trying to like do the math in my brain to see whether or not i have harmony or well, not I, it, it's it's just a question of how much is going to be done by that planet yeah how much can the planet do you know yeah. basically is what i'm getting at because it's like when the ascendant and the lord are the chart set then they make the inclinations of the soul much more open much more unimpeded you know in they're 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 spontaneous, they're, they're very effective. Mm -hmm. These are key words that go with that. If they're contrary, then sometimes the inclinations of our souls are a little bit more obscured. They're, they're a little indistinct, you know, and it's like there's this gray zone all of a sudden in our lives that we're treading where we don't really have this real distinct features. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I knew I was going to be in relationships. I mean, it's what I wanted to do since I was a kid. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have kids. I mean, you can't get any more, you know, distinct and, you know, kind of, yeah. you know, I have a, I have a goal in life. Yeah. Even though, okay, my oh, Venus is in a triplicity. I mean, it's yeah. not totally lost, but at the same time, the fact that it's in a sign where things break down instead of developing it was the result of all that. Anyway. It's, it's uh, awesome. So this is something that I, I felt was very important mm -hmm. when, just, when, when examining the ascendant and using this first technique of primary motivation is to mm -hmm. also look at, well, is all of this in agreement, you know? Mm -hmm. How distinct is it going to be in a person's life? And that's what looking at sect does. Yeah. I think it's also interesting that you mentioned from you were a kid, you had that as a prime motivation for you because I think that in the 21st century, we tend to, especially in modern astrology, there tends to be like this, this developmental arc between your ascendant, your ascendant ruler and your sun sign, as in one aspect of it rules early life and the other aspect of it is what you grow into. But I, I love this language of the prime motivation. You're the second person to mention it. The, the first person was Joy Usher, who is, who is also associated with Robert Solar as well and studied with him. She's from Australia. But this concept of prime motivation, I think it's really the best description of what we're talking about because I can think of nothing else that I'm more primarily motivated by than my Jupiter. And it seems as if it's the same for you. Yes, well, even though it's not in the best of shape, that's still where I went. And you have to, it's not only your, but what about the ruler of your ruler? Okay, you have to look, it's, mine is in Scorpio. Well, what is the shape of Mars, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, I have Mars in the ninth house in its exaltation. Mm. And you think about where I spent a lot of my 20 years of my life as a missionary, mm -hmm. you know, and... Uh, it, Mars is also the ruler of my part of spirit, which is in the 12th house. So it's the poor, the needy. Yes. The, I mean, my chart, it, it, when it, it's, it speaks so loud, when you understand the concepts around it. Yes. Right? And it's not psychological. It's just things that happen <laughs> in my life. Uh, yeah. from an, I can remember when I was 12 years old, cutting lawns and saving the money and sending it to missionaries. Wow. wow. I was 12 years old. And it's something I did, you know. So this has always been a part of my life. Yeah. I never thought the day would come when I would just sell everything I owned and leave America. You know, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Uh, so again, you know, the ascendant, yes, where yeah. uh, that's where we're at right now. And, and that is actually the very first beginning of things. I'm happy that you also brought in the dispositor of the chart ruler, because that's something that, Marina speaks about as well in his work where he says that the planet placed someplace will tell you your initial interaction with the themes of that planet. So your Venus and Scorpio in the seventh house tells you your initial interaction with that Venus. 
but the dispositor is the one that has the final say. So final the fact, say, yes. right. So the fact that you have Mars exalted in the ninth house and that has worked out so well for you, even in light of the difficulties that you may have experienced within the world, within partnerships, whatever, it, it still has been a ben of a benefic influence, I think, within the yeah. overall scope of your life. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Mars is a malefic. Uh, when you have, uh, when you have a, a, a malefic house, a, a house on the seventh that's ruled by malefic, you can pretty much expect yeah. in my life there was going to be controversies in relationships, there's going to be arguments, there's going to be you yeah. know, Martian things. Yeah. But a lot of people don't understand that a controversy doesn't necessarily mean you're an enemy. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know anybody, anybody who's ever been married that hasn't had some argument with their, their yeah. partner, and their wife, or partner, whatever they got. Yeah. And where they've, okay, it has to be resolved. It's part of growing. I mean, is it good? No. I mean, it's not nice when you have an argument. I, I don't like to say, well, it's, it, it, the result will be that we grow from it. I'm very stoic in my my philosophies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not. I, I, I take things as they come. I'm, yeah. I see things as all as a, a way to grow in life, and uh, not everything is pleasant. As a lot of unpleasant things happen in life, that's mm -hmm. why there's one of the planets. But anyway, uh, we're getting back to our subject here. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is actually one of the first steps in delineating character right and i like the technique i think it's ben dykes actually wrote a very good letter uh called the ha happiness in medieval uh, astrology or yes what was it called yes um, i think that was the name of it it's a happiness in medieval astrology yeah mm -hmm. uh, and it's an excellent letter by the way it's an excellent excellent article that he wrote because it really describes it more of a, on a philosophical basis than on the actual technique, but uh, it's very good. I recommend reading it because it's uh, right. got a lot of good points in it. But after you, that's actually, like I said, the first step is looking at the ascendant, checking to see first the nature and qualities of the sign, sect harmony. Uh, then you get into things like qualities of the soul. Now, this is, uh, this is something from Ptolemy. And I know there's a lot of people don't really like Ptolemy so much. Um, I love Ptolemy. <laughs> I mean, well, I, you know, I can respect the man. Uh, let me put it like yeah. this because he was, I don't believe he was an astrologer in any way, shape, or form. But I think he had access to a lot of material. Mm -hmm. He was first a French, he was first a first of French, there is no reason there. He was first of all a, uh, a, an astronomer, a mathematician, he was a scientist, right? That's a lot of Aristotle in, in Ptolemy when he's looking at the, the elements of the science and things like this. He was very Aristotelian. Mm -hmm. uh, so when he was reading through this material and, and, and accumulating it, sometimes he would remove things because well, it didn't fit his science. It didn't fit the way that he thought it should fit. Mm -hmm. I don't think he did it on purpose to for example, to uh, yeah, reform astrology by any means. I don't think that was it. His, his whole purpose was just to recount astrology and what it was. He just took the parts that he liked. <laughs> Basically, is how it worked out. You know, he, he took the things that he liked. I mean, when he when he talks about the the twelfth parts, for example, yeah, he says, "Well, there's no scientific basis for it, so I'm just going to give you two one sentence about it, and that's it." <laughs> So that was basically it, you know. Mm -hmm. But in other authors, you get reams of material about it. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't talk about any of the other lots, for example. The only lot that he talked about is a lot of fortune. So these are things he didn't discuss because, as he put it, they don't have any basis in science or astronomy and the movements of the planets and this and that and the other. So anyway, uh, <laughs> so I think Ptolemy, I, but I still, he still, this, this chapter on the qualities of the soul, which is in the third book. Yeah, Proem 3 something something. Well, it's, yeah, it's in book 3 and it's uh, chapter 13 of that book. 
Ptolemy talks about the qualities of the soul when he talks about, but it's not, uh, this was really a, such a thing. Johannes Schoener, he ca almost copies this verbatim you know, from Ptolemy. <laughs> so, and it's in Hephaestio. Hephaestio was, uh, didn't talk any, so much about it, but put it in, in words like he says, uh, of such qualities, those concerning the more noetic or intellectual uh, and rational part are grasped through the condition that is studied in accordance to the star of uh, Mercury and concerning the part that is non-rational pertaining to the moon. And he gives the whole kind of, in a nutshell, how it works. Mm -hmm. And this actually is a technique that I use a lot. I use it in delineating all my charts. Me too. Um, when discussing, I remember when uh, I was I was working with Sharon at the time we were doing a delineation to uh, see who was going to be elected in the election last election in the States, you know, and we were talking about Trump and I said, well, he's not a Leo, I'm sorry. Well, everybody says he has this Leo ascendant because he's fiery, he's this and that. I said, yeah, but he's very defensive. He, he has a feminine sign on, on the ascendant because that's the way he reacts to everything. If you look, watch him in, a, in a, an interview or in a press conference, I mean, uh, a journalist will say something, and it will snap back, he reacts. Mm -hmm. It's feminine, and it's not a masculine sign, it's very feminine. But if you look at the qualities of his soul, you'll see he's very caustic, very, these, these elements are in the qualities of his soul. When you, just, when you start looking at Mercury, and when you start looking at the moon, what planet rules them, what is the relationship to the uh, sun, you know, all the things that Ptolemy brings into it. And you get a very good mental picture of somebody. <laughs> yeah. Not only mental, but emotional uh, of the person. Mm -hmm. And so this is actually a very important part to, to do as well, because you want to see what is the qualities of this person's soul? You know, what, what is their intellectual capacity? What is their emotional? Uh, how do they react to things emotionally, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, if you, for example, I go back to my chart here, uh, I have the moon in Libra, and uh, I have uh, Mercury in Scorpio. So those two planets, Venus and Mars, again, they're the sect. Yeah. So those qualities are going to be what? They're going to be much more unimpeded. They're going to be uh, very obvious. They're going to be all these qualities because they're of the sect. Mm -hmm. and both planets have testimonies of the signs where they are. Venus is in Tricity, Libra is Scorpio. So... Um, they're, they're going to have something to say. Mm -hmm. But it tells a lot about, you know, I, I find it very valuable to do because what is a person going to be interested in? Uh, a person that has kind of a, a short memory and uh, maybe has a hard time focusing uh, intellectually on things, works more emotionally, may not be good for some jobs. You know, they, may, they, they won't even be attractive to some jobs. Being a bookkeeper, for example, where you have to sit, and you have to focus, and you have to, you know, work with numbers all the time, and, and that may not be something that interests them. So all these things are going to give you indications about the, the native, mm -hmm. right? which is why it's important to, to do this delineation. Mm -hmm. Not really, I don't know if you call it psychological. I guess it is bordering on psychology. I think that our classical and traditional astrological approaches to assessing the soul of the native and his wit and understanding and his manner and temperament. I think these are the rudiments of what we call psychology today. And to, yeah, and, and to a large degree, insofar as we are describing these non-tangible parts of a person's nature, I think that it is appropriate to call it psychology and that there isn't anything quote unquote wrong with the word psychology itself in describing this, but I think the point of departure is where this classical approach to a uh, classical psychological understanding of a person turns into what we now call psychological astrology. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Agree. Yeah. 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 We can agree on that. Right? Yeah. Um, so this was, this is another, and there's, there's a lot of things you have to do when you're looking at these things, you have to look at what signs the planets are in themselves. Um, Mercury and the Moon, for example, they're one thing if they're in a 
in a, in a movable sign, in a solstitial sign, for example, Aries, Libra, Cancer, uh, they say the souls are going to be uh, fitted for dealing with people. <laughs> fond of turbulence. They like things to change. They like action, yeah. political activity. You know? yeah. These are all, and, and you know, Aries is a royal sign. So, mm -hmm. um, so there's, there, it, they have, it has a kind of a, a quality that's given by the sign itself that the that the Mercury and the Moon are, are in. Uh, mine being in Libra, it makes you know, a people person. Yeah, it's a, it's somebody that I, I enjoy dealing with people. I like working with people, you know? mm -hmm. even though I am quite a recluse on the other <laughs> side. Yeah. Uh, so bicorporeal signs and uh, mutual mutable signs is what they call you know, being changeable, a little bit hard to understand the person. I mean. They can, they can, you know, mm -hmm. eh, and they go back and forth and flip flop, and that's kind of what that means. Mm -hmm. uh, being in a solid or fixed sign, you know, makes them makes a person just, makes them uh, unaffected by flattery. Mm -hmm. uh, both mine, uh, Mar Mercury, uh, is in a fixed sign. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so, so does that mean that flattery doesn't work on you? Uh, not really. I, I'm, I'm very allergic to flattery, actually, which is why I don't do a lot of interviews and things, because I don't like to put myself out there. Well, I, 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 I don't like lifting myself up. I guess it's because my experience tells me if you put your head up too high, you might get shot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, yeah, but it is something you have to kind of get used to. <laughs> it's like we had this little thing between us the other day. Uh, I had to hum eat humble pie. Oh, <laughs> yeah. so it, it, that's what happens when you stick your head up, right? But that's okay. okay. I don't mind that. I just don't. Uh, I, 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 I like to be appreciated. Who doesn't? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think everybody appreciate enjoys appreciation. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between appreciation and man worship. This is you true. Know? There's a very big difference, and I just. I've avoided being in the limelight a lot because I don't want to get into this, you know, worship of an individual or, oh, he's so great. And, he's, uh, and it's an awful lot to ask anybody to live up to. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. So, so yeah, as, as a fixed sign, I'm not really affected by flattery in that, in that sense. I mean, I don't get a big head and don't walk around like this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can be very contentious, very ambitious. You know, these are all things that are fixed signs well as well. So it has its, you know, plus qualities, has its negative qualities. Yeah. So that is that is where I go next. After looking at the ascendant, I go to the qualities of the soul. Mm -hmm. and again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because in order, each one of these subjects is a class in itself. Yeah. I could make I could make talking about the ascendant a four hour lecture. <laughs> Seriously, I could pull up examples, hundreds of dozens of examples, show you and the natives like how these things work out. That that's what learning is all about, right? Yeah. And when you're talking about it, you start seeing all the see, this is another thing that I've never given myself over is to looking at celebrities, looking at their charts. For the biggest reason that I don't know them. <laughs> I'm, I'm not intimate with that person mm -hmm. so I don't know what's being said is true, false I know from my own personal experience dealing with clients I've had I've said things to clients and no that's not true Yeah, they'll tell me no that's not true but then you deal with them for a little while and they start, you win their trust and you start talking to them and they relax around you I've had them come back to me and say you know when you mentioned that over there yeah. yeah, it is kind of true. Because yeah. people are people, you know, they're embarrassed about things in their life. They're things that maybe not everybody's proud about. And when you start point, putting fingers on some of these things, people can react to it. Because yeah. that's the thing with traditional astrology. It's very, it's very objective. Yeah. I'm not going to temper anything by my subjective opinion on it, you know. But mm -hmm. I'm going to give things as it comes objectively. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, Kind of like being in a glaring light sometimes, yeah. And, uh, but I mean, none of my—I've never lost a client. But uh, like I said, it depends, you know. Uh, so these are things that we're going to talk about. Is we're going to talk about very honestly, you know, 
What is your what are the qualities of your character? What are the qualities of your soul? How do you think? You know, and you, you that is underneath now the sign, right? Because you know where their intentions, you know where they want to go. Now you're seeing, okay, how do they relate to all of this? You yeah. know themselves, right? How they think, their intellect, their emotions, and then uh, you can get to the temperament, right? You start talking about temperament. Um, Temperament is about their bodily condition, right? I mean, how a person is, it's physical qualities, constitution, physical health, their bodily health, uh, characteristics that they may have physically. That's one side of temper, temperament. The other side is, is kind of by extension that you have, uh, you, you gain qualities of character as well, right? A person, uh, I, I have a cold and dry sign, so therefore, uh, my ascendant is very melancholic, right? Am I melancholic? I'm actually quite fiery. And people say, well, I, I don't see the melancholy in you. <laughs> well, it's because, first of all, I have Jupiter that aspects the ascendant degree. Yeah. And, I have, and my ascendant is in the terms of Mars. And I have the sun aspecting my ascendant. So there's a lot of fire, a lot of heat. <laughs> so that, that changes my temperament. Yeah. yeah, I have a side of me that's, that I tend to be recluse, to give myself over to study and, you know, uh, being quiet. And I, 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 I don't know how I managed for all those years with 12 children. <laughs> 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 because living on my own now, it's perfectly peaceful and still. And you think, wow, how did I get through all those years with all that noise and confusion all the time? Uh, but we adapt, right? <laughs> Anyway, so the temperament is going to give us another aspect of the person, mm -hmm. which deals with the, our physical and how those physical things can either limit us or open doors and things like this. Mm -hmm. uh, you say a person who's choleric is, you know, always seeking activity and, you know, more likely to have accidents and things like this. Yeah. You know? This is the, which you, which you come by. And of course, those two places again, it's the ascendant. But now we're going to bring in the moon, right? Because the moon mm -hmm. is very much incorporated in the temperament. Mm -hmm. uh, I follow Ptolemy very much on this. I, Ptolemy was the simplest and the clearest instructions, in my opinion. So uh, I go to him for some of these very basic delineations. And then lastly, uh, we get into something that's a little bit more spiritual, a little bit more depth. Like I said, uh, our lives are full of actions. What we want to do. How we act in the world. And Vicious Valens, of all the authors I've ever read, is the one who really puts all that into perspective. I've written a very long um, piece on the lot of spirit and a lot of fortune. I've never published it. I, I guess there's only a few people that have actually read it. But I get into the relationship and talk about how Aristotle presents in Nicomedes and the Ethics. He talks about two kinds of actions. You know, you have the noble actions in the world, those that deal with politics, those who, that come from the mind and the heart, and you know, things that are motivated by uh, morals. Very much the spirit, a lot of spirit. If you listen to Vicious Valens when he describes it, it's you know that's what he's describing. Then you have the person, uh, something that's called poesis, which is your actual, what you do with your body and how you physically use it and things, crafts, what to use your hand, leading crafts. And things. So there's two different kinds of actions in our church and that's seen by the, the part of spirit and part of a uh, lot of uh, fortune. These things are very important at that point. And then on top of that, you have a lot of lots that give insights into the person the person's desires well look at a lot of eros right so the lots certain lots especially the hermetic lot, lots give us a lot of insight to how things are colored how our mind is colored uh, because you talk about desires while well, your mental uh, direction is going to be put through desires and to desire something uh, so it all works together and it gets to be an awful lot. 
But the last element that I look at is the Almonton figures, which is again, and again, my teaching on this probably, I, I know there's some people that have reacted on it because, well, that's not exactly what they meant. They said it was a guardian angel in this. I, I believe in angels, don't misunderstand me. I believe yeah. very much in angels. Uh, just not in that personal angel that they're talking about. Well, we do have yeah. personal angels, but they don't lead us and guide us like that. Yeah. In my opinion. Yes, yes, yes. This is this is my own faith. Yeah. So when I look at the albums and figures, I'm, every person, every one of us, I know that uh, Young, he talked about this, that you have the conscious and the unconscious mind, and we can describe what the conscious mind is. But he said there's very little. We have no way of talking about the unconscious mind because we can't put our finger on it. It's those things that underlie it. Actually, if you read uh, Plato, when he talks about uh, there's the spirit that binds the soul, that's what this daemon was. And, and it's what binds the qualities of the soul. And, and in my opinion, that's what this is. It's our individual spirit. Each of us has a spirit that is our own spirit. It's given to us. And understanding that spirit will help us understand what directions we, how we make those directions and how we put those motivations into effect. I have a, the moon as my own figure. So, and the moon is all about caring and about giving and about, uh, and when you think that I spent my whole life caring and giving for other people, my children, my work as a missionary, this was the main spirit of my life that was guiding me the whole time so i can see it in all things it's like an overriding uh, if you will element that binds it all together that leads and guides everything into what we do and how we do it i didn't i never wanted a profession where i was cold or separate from doing something that was going to be a benefit for people my last job i was uh, uh, a project manager for the county here where I live and my whole job was to make life better for the people who live here so I built uh, parks I built uh, you know promenades that go through the town city sitter building up things making it so the people would use it it was for the people that that was my and I was I was happy with that and that's what I really wanted to do that was the uh, this is great, you know, I'm doing something, I'm giving back to the world here, you know, and creating a, an environment for, them, for people to live in, that, you know, that they're happy and that they thrive. And so, yeah, it makes, I can see it in my life very clearly. I see it in a lot of my clients' lives too when we talk about it. They see it as well. It's that part of us where it says, know thyself, right? When we get down to that bottom line and say you have to really understand Really understand yourself and what is the motivation behind everything. What yeah. binds it all and leads it. And that's what the element of figures is. It's what it was meant to, to delineate anyway. Only they saw it as a guardian angel, something outside of the person leading them, which is something I never understood because why use all the places of life, which is the ascendant and the sun and the moon and uh, the prenatal uh -huh. nation and a lot of fortune, and uh, yeah, those are the five. When, when a guardian them. angel, something happening to you, it's one of the accidents, you know. But this is something originating in the person, you know. Yeah. That's how the difference that I see in it. So just so people understand, I've written about it too. I I think on my Facebook page, I even put something up on the Albertine figures or one kind, of, mm -hmm. kind of explain a little bit where I was coming from. Mm -hmm. Well, so those are the main elements that in, in any case that I use, that I see used the most. Of course, you have variants of things. You have like the Lord of the Genitor, right? Uh, in the Hellenistic astrology, you had a predominator in the house master. All of these things were very symbolic to something that leads the person's life, right? So, <clears throat> uh, like I said, uh, the Persians developed their astrology to be a really full system of things and so that's why i, I practice mainly persian astrology uh, although if you ask me is the planet combust well i say well does the sun receive it where it's at 
if the sun receives it, I can show you in mashallah, and mashallah says, well, if the sun receives it, it's not, it's not burnt out. Mm -hmm. And then we have in, on every writer in the Hellenistic era, not except Balin's, but every other one, they mentioned that a planet and its chariot were, was covered and was not burned, you know. Some just gave some things, other people, other authors gave a little bit more, talked about it. So there is the only con the controversy I see there is well, which dignity was it that <laughs> covered that? Yeah. But there, I, I practice those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And if you really look at what they said about combustion, you'll find that when they talk about it, they always talk about the planet entering into combustion. Uh, when the planet has its hel heliacal setting, mm -hmm. and it runs under the beams up until it joins the sun and becomes Kazimi, or what they call Kazimi, in the heart of the sun. But after it passes, all of a sudden, that whole idea of combustion changes because every one of them talks about, well, seven days from the time, about seven, eight degrees, nine degrees, before it, 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 it's very fortunate place for it to be. It's a very promising place. It gives positive indications. So even though it's still under the, it's still under the beams. So, and they talk about Mercury because Mercury is always, almost always <laughs> under the More beams. More or less. That, you know, that, that running under the beams was one thing, when it was leaving, it was another. So again, it's when you look at all these things and you start realizing, well, our art is a little bit more detailed <laughs> than, well, it's combust, therefore throw it out, it's no use. Yeah. Or it's retrograde. I, I had that discussion. I've seen that discussion. Uh, um, I think it was in this uh, Facebook group. That this, this guy put up a chart about this girl that he knows. He gave four alternatives. He said, well, she's either having, what, is, what, what has happened on this date? She had a baby. Uh, she lost a child. Uh, what was the other choices? The one was that she entered into some kind of a legal dispute and won a legal case. And the third one is she started a business or something like this. And uh, it was in an eighth house perfected year, which was Pisces. And Jupiter was there. Of course, Jupiter was in his thing and ruled the fifth house. Mm -hmm. And in the fifth house was the part of children. <laughs> so I immediately said, well, in my mind, there's only one answer to this. And that's this woman had a child. And people said, well, but it's in the eighth house. You know, well, the eighth house is a, is, is a succeeding house. For that planet itself, that planet has strength being succeeding. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and it sees the fifth house. So when it's talking about children, then in that case, you know, it's not talking about the native, but it's talking about actually you know, the children coming, you know. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the solar return, and, and Jupiter was in the midheaven, which is the place that gives children, that people always, they always, they always look to the 10th house, and especially if Jupiter's there. Uh, by the way, I have Jupiter in the 10th house. <laughs> so everybody, and, and, and the fascinating thing about my chart is that every perfected year that came to Jupiter, when Jupiter had rule, I had children. Wow. <laughs> Only one exception. One exception out of 12 children. One wow. exception. <laughs> when it came to the house, when it, when it was the sons. I don't know why I did that. But anyway, it did. <laughs> I guess it had to be different. <laughs> that, that child was going to be different anyway. But all the rest were all Jupiter. When it came to a perfected year, when Jupiter had uh, the rule of the year. Mm-hmm. I have Jupiter in the mid heaven. So anyway, uh, yeah. so anyway, I, I, so I said that because, well, it, okay, the eighth house, the, it's a house uh, that uh, maybe the maybe the person was fearful about the birth. First child, maybe it's something that she was scared about. That could be a, a signification for Jupiter in the eighth, a fear of children, right? Uh, so there, there's a lot of things that doesn't necessarily mean, no, it's not going to happen, yeah, just mm -hmm. because it's in the eighth house. And then they said, well, it's retrograde. Well, so what? In, in the solar return, it wasn't retrograde. It was direct. Retrograde isn't for life. <laughs> it was direct. And, and this is something that a lot of people don't understand about natal astrology, is that it's not horary. 
when you're doing a horary or an election, uh, you're, you're doing something right there and now. Yes. You're getting, it's immediate. Yes. So most of the indications and most of the indicators and significators are based around that. Mm -hmm. When you have a nativity, it's for life. It's, it's the life of the native. That life is X number of years, which, you know, this, what is the average length of life today? It's what, 75, 80 years old? Somewhere around there? Yeah. So we're talking about that many years. If you look at my chart, I have no aspects. In my, well, when I say aspects, I have no planets joined in an aspect. Mm -hmm. Yet I've had many things happen in my life. <laughs> Okay, so when I try to get students, it, it, many of the students that have come to me have come from horary, and I've had to kind of erase that, what you learned there. We're going to learn something else now. This is the natal astrology. And it is very different. It is very different. I, I'm sorry. They're similar in their conceptions, but they're very different in the way you're going to read things. Well, for me specifically, whenever I teach my traditional astrology course, which I'm currently in the process of doing, I always teach horary first because I find that horary is a very good training ground for students to begin to understand astrological concepts without them feeling as if they have the quote-unquote right to go buck wild on somebody's birth chart. So I, I feel as if horary, in a sense, gives students a safe space in which to test their abilities that they're currently coming into. But I do agree with you that they are very different, horary and natal. And what I stress for my students in particular is that the major difference is a difference of time. Whereas horary and electional, like you mentioned, are things rooted and based on the moment. The word horary literally means of the hour. Of the hour, yeah. Natal astrology, the gift of natal astrology is that we have a gift of time. So whereas if you have a combust, essentially debilitated Mars and Cancer retrograde in the 12th house, in a horary chart, then that is objectively speaking awful in relation to what that Mars represents. When you have that same Mars and Cancer retrograde combust within your natal chart, you have a lifetime to figure that out. You, you will, well, you will, yeah. um, You're going to, the, the planet's going to change. When right. you get into predictive work, you see uh, uh, Abu Mishar talks about that. He talks, mm -hmm. if in the natal chart it's bad, but in the solar return or in mm -hmm. the perfected sign, it happens to be this, then it's going to ameliorate the things that there was in the nativity. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's very clear about this. It, 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 it's not, in other words, what you see in a nativity is, when I talk about delineation, let me just explain something. I talk about uh, how um, I'm sure everybody's painted a room in their house. And the first thing you do when you're going to paint something is that you go around all the trim in the house, around the windows, around all the light sockets, around the baseboard and all these things. You, you cut the room in, it's called. Yeah. Well, that's delineation. In other <laughs> words, you just marked out the whole room. Yeah. What the whole room is about, right? And that's what natal delineation does. We don't, natal delineation doesn't say, I mean, we can get kind of a general idea with things because when we're using triplicity rulers, for example, uh, if, you, if you're working with, uh, let's say you want to look at three triplicity rulers of the sect luminary, you can say, well, the first luminary is going to be, well, the Greeks said for half their, you know, first part of their life, second one, second part of their life. The Persians said the first, second, and third part of their life. Uh, there, there's a little different perspective on that. What I do <laughs> is I kind of follow Hellenistic tradition a little bit closer there. But at any rate, I'm just, that's neither here nor there. But the idea that I'm trying to say is that those rulers give us a time frame. Yeah. Just like Ptolemy's age as a man gave us, you know, the first four years is the moon, the next 11 is uh, Mercury, the next, you know, yeah. uh, Venus, and then the sun, and then, uh, so forth, Mars, Jupiter, mm -hmm. Saturn. Uh, all these have periods of time. And that in a very general way, 
it's a very general delineation. You can say, well, uh, and there's many of those kind of delineations in the early authors who are say, well, if the first lord of the triplicity is there, then this person will probably have children in the first part of life, in the first half of their life. Okay, it kind of, but when, when is that? Well, it can't be when they're 11 years old. It has to be from a certain, you know, they, can, they have to be of age to have children. It has to be, you know, a little bit more. So we, we can kind of get an idea of the person's life, generally speaking, from a nativity. And you can't make any kind of prediction without delineating the chart first. This was Robert Zoller's Alpha and Omega. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, don't even try to make a prediction unless you've delineated the chart. Because if it's not promised in the chart, if there's no possibility of it, then it's just not going to happen. I mean, you're wasting your time. You're wasting the, the client's time. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I guess a lot of people would say, well, that's very deterministic. Well, we have a free will, but what if astrology actually takes free will into consideration? St. Mm -hmm. uh, Augustus uh, wrote some very heavy things about how he saw the world as spirit. If God is in the eternal now, if he lives in the past, present, and future, he knows what everything is, then he knows what our, our lives are. Okay? He doesn't interfere with it, but he knows it. Well, he writes it in the stars. That was the church's way of kind of getting it. And if it's written in the stars, then you can read it. But that's not deterministic. It's just be, like if I see up here in the road and there's an accident. Well, I know there's an accident. In the road. Mm. That's not deterministic. <laughs> it's just a fact. You know, it's just something that, and in a way, that's kind of how I see our traditional astrology. Yeah. It's not that it's, well, it's so fatalistic and, you know, this is going to happen. Well, if the chart says it, it probably will in some way or form. It's going to happen in your life. A lot of the good and bad things happen to everybody. I don't care who they are. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of getting down to the nitty gritty of our natal delineation is really important. That's why these things like this that we're talking about, when we're talking about the character of the native, is uh, we're not really making moral judgments or anything like that about people. That's not what it's about. Uh, that's very subjective to make a moral judgment. But you can understand people's morals. You can understand their religious affiliations. You can understand all these things from the chart. I think at the end of the day, you do enough astrology, you read enough charts, you start to realize that this quandary that we have in our minds regarding fate and free will, it, it moves to the back burner of your mind the more charts you read. Like, I, after 15 years of being in astrology, and you being in it much longer than me, I'm sure that you don't still battle with this concept of, is it fate, is it free will? Because at the end of the day, you just get so deeply immersed within your craft that you realize that that conversation is kind of neither here nor there. And it's just about being observers of time and the movement of time and cycles of time, essentially. Yes. And when you talk about the ascendant, you know, we're talking about prime motivation, when we're talking about the will, <laughs> yeah. we're talking about what are they going to choose, right? That, that's what we're learning about is how to decide seeing the choices. It doesn't take away free choice. None of that takes yeah. away free choice. They still have free choice. I, I think a lot of people get this wrong impression of free choice, like they're going to choose absolutely everything in their life. Well, that doesn't happen. Yeah. I, you can ask me, I, I mean, there were things I made choices in, but when I made those choices, they were where my desires, where my prime motivation was leading me. I'm sorry, they always yeah. were. And even though I was unaware of it, as I'm aware of it now, I look back and I say, wow, okay, I lived up to that one, didn't I? Yeah. You know? So yeah. the whole... The, it, I think people are afraid to think. It's not that my life was faded either. You know, it's not like it's faded in any situation. It just fate is a, is an awful term as well. It just means those <laughs> things which are which we decide are going to happen and things are. I mean, I don't just if I'm out and driving and somebody runs into me. I didn't decide that. It happened.
happened to me. It was an accident, yeah. which is what they call the 12 hours, the 11 houses around the Zenit. Yeah. <laughs> right? Accidents, you know? So the only place where I am really putting my will into things is like where my natal ascendant was, for example. Mm -hmm. But we didn't talk about that. But if you're na also the other planets can also give significations to your desires and will in your life, for example. Uh, especially the planets, my ascendant is in the terms of Mars. And Mars sees my ascendant. And mm -hmm. Mars is in its exaltation, a very powerful place in the chart. And that's going to have an effect. It's also going to be a direction in my life, although a minor one. It's not going to be the same as the, the, the ruler of my chart, but it's going to be something that forms my life and has a lot to say about, you know, both professions and things like this. So mm -hmm. it's understanding. We talk about dignity a lot, and I, that term is kind of thrown around a lot. But, uh, I prefer the, the word testimony because the planet has a certain testimony in every sign. Uh, I've changed my language a lot, learning classical and medieval astrology. Uh, they do talk about, um, even when they're translating these days, the new translations kind of avoid terms that we've kind of endeared ourselves to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, it, it's been a lot of, I, I've changed a lot in the last, you know, 15 years. Let's put mm -hmm. it that way. I learned under Robert Zoller. He got me started in the direction I've gone. I've grown from that time. You know, and uh, I hope I'm carrying his banner further in a lot of ways. So. Yeah. So, wow. Um, well, Stephen, it was really an honor and an absolute privilege to be able to sit down with you today. And I know for you it's this evening, but, but yeah. to be able to... <laughs> Well, it's still sun here in Norway. It's sun until you know one o'clock in the morning. That was so wow. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't get dark until one o'clock in the morning. I, I would love to experience that at some point. Well, in the winter time, it's worse because it never gets light until <laughs> you know, like ten o'clock in the morning. Uh, it, it has its ups and its downs. Wherever there's a positive, there's a negative. So yeah, it's very yeah. cold and it's dark and it's, you know. Uh, yeah. But right now it's, I don't live so far north, I, and, and I used to, I used to live further north, where I could uh, go out and watch the northern lights all the time. Wow. That's really a treat. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh yeah, it's very beautiful. Norway's a lovely country. I'm sure it is. Stephen, this has been truly an amazing privilege of mine to be able to sit down with you oh, mine too. and yeah, and, and talk with you and learn from you today. And can you please let our listeners and viewers know where they can find you online and the website and anything? I have no website. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had one a long time ago, which was modern, and I closed it down and I shut down everything. I, I have no association with that anymore. Okay. Uh, I don't have a website. I don't have, I have a Facebook page. Um, like I said, I haven't really put myself out there because I don't, yeah. that's just not my, Yeah. it's not my, my personality or not my thing really at all to, yeah. I have some people behind me pushing me saying, come on. <laughs> Come on. Well, nice well, day. well. You're you're going to be offering a course soon, and so yes. people are going to need to be able. Well, they, to I can give my email address. That, okay. Uh, very. It's a uh, uh, stebi at online dot no. It's a s t e b i. Alpha curl. Online is one word. Dot n o. Okay. That's my email address. So if people are interested, if they want to contact me, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, as I said, I, I've been just trying to decide, do I want to have a new web page? And I think in the end, I'm going to have to do it. Uh, not necessarily. I, I, I'm more like ben, like ben talked about this. He wrote his course. He's thinking about having other people teach the course. You know, yeah. that maybe he's not going to be as involved in it. And I might do the same, something that's similar to the same. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not the person to stand out in the forefront, you know, wave my flag and 
Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to put your contact information down below in the description box so that people can reach out to you. And yes. do, do you have a general time frame in which you think you're looking at this course starting or is that still in the works? Well, I have one student and uh, she's kind of my guinea pig. <laughs> she didn't have a whole lot of background in, in astrology, so it was very nice to have somebody like that. Yeah. Uh, I've only done the first section. I have it's in three sections. The first section is on the basics, mm -hmm. astronomy, because I teach geocentric astronomy. Because if you don't understand it, then you're not going to get classical astrology. Because there's yeah. too many delineations that are based on that. Yeah. Uh, the second section of my course I'm working on now, which is on delineation, and there I go into like I said, I'm going and talking about the first three lessons are actually going to be on the ascendant. So it's, it's I give homework, it's a lot of work. Uh, and then it's all the different, well, we'll talk about children, we'll talk about illnesses, not necessarily house by house, because uh, they didn't really do it that way. I mean, it's presented oftentimes, like in Saul, it's presented house by house. Yeah. When they talk about the fourth house, but then he says he never gives the mother as the tenth house or the father as the fourth house. He says the yeah. father is either the sun or Saturn, and the moon is either the moon or Venus. Uh, the mother is either moon or Venus, uh, and then uh, the fourth house is about the parents and all the delineations that deal with family and parents is he derives from there. It's very interesting to look at. Mm -hmm. I, I really encourage. Uh, I'm going to use that book as my uh, textbook, mm -hmm. along with a couple other things. Um, and I take it you're not referring to the works of Saul and Masha Allah, the- No, I'm not one? This is the okay. second, uh, this is the new publication that Ben Dykes released because it's all the old ones, but it, in it is the book on nativities, okay. which is something that's never been translated. And that, that work in itself, <laughs> I cannot recommend it enough <laughs> for people to read. Take your time, study it. I, like I said, I pulled gold nuggets out of that all the time. This quote about, you know, using the ascendant and prime motivation. Yeah. It, it, was, it was in his works. Yeah. I, 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 I discovered many things about that. Yeah. So that's actually the, my main textbook in delineation is using that book. And then the third section is going to be nothing but prediction. Okay, because that's the order you have to learn it. First you have to learn the basics, then you learn about delineating the chart. When you can delineate the chart, then you can predict from the chart. Mm -hmm. And that one is gonna be, then I'm going to use Abu Mashar's book on that one. Well, so. well, we definitely can't wait for you to be done with that. and. I think that it's appropriate at this point for us to just acknowledge that we all owe Dr. Benjamin Dykes a huge oh. debt of gratitude for the work that he's done in bringing. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. I mean, everybody that's worked on these since 1990s, you know, the flood of materials that we've had, and it's been a flood. Yeah. And it's not just them, but I mean, we've had people like Charles Burnett and David Pingree. We have those different scholars that have published different things whose works you have to kind of read sometimes with a little grain of salt to Shlomo, for example. Yes. Another example. Uh, the, these, Nishio uh, Yano, we have uh, Charles Burnett, we have all these different people working to translate these things which have never been translated before. Mm -hmm. And uh, they made it possible for people like me to read, to yeah. learn, you know. And so I'm very grateful, not only to Ben, but I mean, he's done, a, a, I can't, I can't <laughs> even begin to explain. I, I don't know how he does it. I really don't. <laughs> uh, to do the work that he does, the translations, and then have a life on the side. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. The guy is amazing. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, he, he definitely has done the lion's share. And yes. I am currently trying to write one tiny book and it is a mammoth task for me. And Van Dykes comes out with like three books a year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he drops them like, you know, 
<laughs> my wife did children. <laughs> I guess that's a good analogy right there. Uh, uh, yeah, but he does. He's very, very... Um, <laughs> What is the word in English? He's very uh, fertile when it comes to <laughs> his uh, ability to do this job, which is to provide the materials for the rest of us. He is most definitely fertile in that regard. Now, I would be very, I would be ex excited to look at his course. I imagine it's very good. Most definitely. Just, you know, so I mean, so many people are offering courses. So I don't find that really a big priority in my life. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I I find it. A, I want to help people. I want to work with people. I want to you know be there in the background. I, yeah, you can ask Sharon about that. I'm more or less behind the scenes you know, when we do things. So yeah, we have several papers in the work right now. I'm doing one on perfections that because in Abu Mashar in his uh, in this last translation, we became privy to the fact that in monthly perfections that he would reverse directions depending on the sign that the yearly perfection fell on. Sharon mentioned that to me. And that really made me curious, even though not everybody's jumped on that bad wagon. It doesn't fit the, has the chiseled in stone idea that we have of it. But I, I started doing a lot of research on it. Yeah. And it was very fascinating, the things I was digging up. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps the way that we're looking at perfections, the conception of them is perhaps we move them always around, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's the way they described also their primary directions in the same way. The description of them are exactly the same. So perhaps the conception is the same. Maybe actually it's the diurnal motion carrying the signs over the ascendant. It, 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 it's, uh, what is it? it's um, Paulus, when he's talking about perfections, he says, when the ascendant is, when they pass through the ascendant, the signs are passing. And that made me kind of pick up my ear. What do you mean they're passing through the ascendant? I thought the ascendant was being taken to them. Yeah. And maybe our conception is limiting us in understanding why people like Abu Mushar, for example, reversed the direction. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my motivation along with uh, Sharon. And uh, so we've been digging up charts. We, we have a lot of examples. Of charts where we reversed it and with astounding results. Wow! Really remarkable things that are happening. So, yeah, it's, I want to try it. I want to see if it's worth, you know. Yeah. I mean, Abu Mushar didn't put it out there for nothing. Right. Well, I'm I'm super excited to dig into that work, and both you and Sharon are great erudite astrologers, and I can't wait to see what comes of it because I think that these attempts within our classical framework to create a better, more practical, more workable astrology should be commended because we need more of that, especially today, especially within our traditional methods. So thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you so much for being here today. So and little. I feel, I feel it's very little, but uh, uh, I'm here working behind the scenes. So. And I'm all, and look, if people want to write me, it's fine. Great. People Great. should feel free. Good stuff. So I will put that contact information for you down below so that people can get in contact with you. And Stephen, once again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for the work that you've done and for being here today with me. Well, thank you for inviting me. By the way, this is my first interview. You were the first. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a virgin ground for me. I've never been caught on tape <laughs> making stupid statements. <laughs> so. Well, I am, I am even more deeply honored by that. And, and, and thank you for allowing me that privilege. No, thank you for asking me. It's a big privilege to do it. Most definitely. You know, it was, it was Sharon. Sharon said, Michael, you know, Stephen Birchfield, he's, and she did this, he's another good one. And I was like, okay, well, well, you know, if, if you say that he's another good one, then I'm going to reach out to Stephen. And I'm, I'm really happy I did because you and I, we've had wonderful communication both on and off air. And you and I, we're, we're cut from the same cloth in many regards. And I'm really grateful to be able to share intellectual as well as astrological space with you. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you very much. 
And to our listeners and viewers out there, if this is your hundredth time being with me here on the Oraculous True Divination Podcast, or if today is your day one, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to you sharing this space with us. I receive your comments, I get your feedback, and most importantly, I see your subscriptions. It matters so much to me that you're joining this magic and this momentum that we're building here. So please do remember to like this video as well as to subscribe to the Oraculous True Divination Podcast and also share this interview with your other astrologically minded friends because more and more astrologers need to know that these conversations are the ones that are happening with astrologers like Stephen, who... Mm. This is his first time <laughs> being interviewed. So, so more people need to celebrate this, 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 what do we call this? This landmark within, <laughs> within Stephen Birchfield's life and so many other astrologers who we have here on the show. So from the bottom of my heart, I love you. Be well. Thank you so much for being here. And until next time. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye to everybody out there. Stephen Birchfield. <laughs> you 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 <laughs> you you stuck your head up above the ground and you're still alive to tell the tale so long so far <laughs> we'll see <laughs> tomorrow we'll see <laughs>